All right, for today's epic woodworking adventure, we have a special treat. We're at the Kimball Jenkins Estate in Concord, New Hampshire, and downstairs, there's a New Hampshire Furniture Masters exhibit going on. We're gonna take a walk around, give you a look at a few of the pieces, and maybe we can snag a few of the makers and have a little chat about their piece. Let's head down. All right, we got a special opportunity to check out this piece front by Tim Coleman. It's only here for this day. About and to get interviewed here. It's going up to a gallery in Maine. But we more than that, we have Tim is here himself. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about the piece. So hey. So Tim, what I know you spent an incredible amount of time. I saw all the photographs on Instagram. How can people find you on Instagram first of all? Uh, Tim Coleman Furniture. Uh, it's my uh, username. Um, Okay. on Instagram and I I try to post uh, process shots of uh, of each piece I'm doing yeah uh, it's good for me because it gives me uh, a reason to create an archive of, uh, of the work that I'm doing yeah and uh, people really enjoy the sharing of the process I love having it. having an insight into how these things get created yeah this is an incredible piece why don't you tell us about it so uh, this is uh, a sideboard styled piece of that scale. Uh, it's made of uh, Claro walnut, which was uh, from uh, Jerry Osgood's collection of wood. Uh, I've got two two different Claro, Claro walnut boards that I use. The, the body of the cabinet is one, and then all the, the legs and the trim are another piece of Claro. The marquetry inlay is uh, curly maple, mm -hmm. and we're getting some nice sunlight on it here, You can and you can see that there's uh, the, the board that I used to for the marquetry had a range of color from almost a greenish gray all the way to a, a very bright uh, blonde where the, the figure shows even more and I decided not to put handles on it and to use uh, oh, that's sweet. a touch latch nice. to open it and that's beautiful interior too and the interior is uh, Japanese oak, so it's a white oak that uh, is a very fine grain uh, white oak. Oh, there. <laughs> That's beautiful, uh, and it's it's a nice uh, nice surprise when you yeah. open it to have that that bright the bright interior. golden interior. And I'm working as I often do, just to create uh, create an effect by changing the grain direction of, of the of the leaves. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a walnut leaf, yes. uh, so to go with the uh, the walnut in the in the cabinet. Uh, so. By changing the grain direction, you get a light, light and dark effect. Uh, the way that the light uh, plays off of the off of the wood. It's so it was a three month, three month project. Three month, uh, yeah. wow. it's, this was my summer. <laughs> it's just stunning. Yeah. Well, thank you. I love it. I'm so glad you brought it here today because. We would never have seen it. So where is it going from here? It's it's going up to the gallery that I work with uh, in Maine, the gallery at Soul's Sound. Yeah. And uh, so she, she's doing a feature on my work uh, during the months of September and October. So this is going to join several other pieces that I have up there and uh, be on display through, through October. And it will stay. It will remain at the gallery after after the exhibit. Beautiful. So, this is actually available. It is. So this this is a speculative piece. So yeah. It was not a commission. Uh, this came entirely out of here. <laughs> And and here, yeah, yeah, uh, and here, that's for sure. So uh, and and in my body of work, I have a number of um, cabinets that use a variety of decorative techniques. Uh, one of them being uh, marquetry. Uh, so this is part of my whole catalog of uh, decorative cabinets uh, that uh, each one with its own own unique character. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean. Tim has some incredible pieces. You got to check out his website. Is it Tim Coleman? Tim Timothy Coleman .com. Timothy Coleman .com. Head over to that website. You will be 
be inspired and you won't be sorry. All right, Tim, thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Tom. All right, the next piece we're gonna check out is made by Roger Myers, and he's an aficionado of the federal period and style, as you can tell by this amazing federal piece, but I'm gonna let Roger describe it because he's standing right here. Hey, Tom. Hey, <laughs> what can so, you tell us? So this piece is actually inspired by two different Portsmouth, New Hampshire pieces that would have dated to around 1815. One was a piece by Judkins and Center, and the other by um, Langley Boardman. So I've sim combined the two of them, they were actually very simple, I combined the two of them a little bit with the, uh, the crotch brooch here and some stringing. This is uh, a Langley Boardman uh, banding right here. Uh, you would see, and I've used it on a, a reproduction piece before, um, crotch brooch, ebony uh, surround here, and then there's some rosewood that's also used up here on the on the edge here. So all of that is uh, New Hampshire white birch uh, for the inlay panels. Did you harvest that yourself? I did. Uh, um, you can't buy that anywhere. You, there's only one way to get it, and that's to, to get it yourself and, and make it. And it's amazing. Most of the pieces end up as firewood, but occasionally you'll come across a really beautiful piece. Yeah. And so it's four drawers. Uh, it's a curved front. It's got about a one-inch curve to it. And... Uh, what would you say that radius is? It's pretty, uh, I pretty don't large. know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, I mean, it's got to be about a... Uh, and then the, these two drawers here, they actually uh, have a false bottom in them, so there's a little bit of... Ooh. Uh, a little bit of... Secret. A little secret. So if you look at the depth of that yeah, drawer, yeah, it's yeah. not the full depth, but there's a second drawer bottom down below it. You're not going to show us how to get in there. No, I'm not. Uh, I don't Find remember myself. Treasure. I don't remember myself either. So, oh, really? You know, that's, there's always that. Let me see if I can figure it out. No, just the drawer bottom slides right out, Tom. That's great. And let me just slide that back in. So this top is veneer? No, that's solid mahogany. Solid mahogany. Solid mahogany. So the, the woods in the piece are the mahogany, the birch, yeah. uh, ebony, uh, holly on the banding, and a little bit of rosewood. Where'd you get the mahogany? The ma that mahogany came from Urian. Nice. Um, so know, genuine. Yeah, it's genuine American. mahogany. That's yeah. uh, I think from Peru. That stuff there. Yeah. And I've had that for a while, but it's probably the only place I'll buy mahogany from would be Urian. Yeah. You know, I know I can call them up and get exactly what I want. And right. Harvested the birch and the uh, and then this is bird's eye maple in here on these panels. Beautiful. So it's a, a sweet piece, but I simplified it a little. The original would have actually had a, a few more details on the lower leg. Really? But it gets to be a little much, yeah. especially in a contemporary setting. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and then the other thing I did different is the back is paneled. Um, okay. So instead of just a board back, uh, it's right. a panel back, which is like, a, little, a little dressier. Sweet. But uh, a real nice piece. So this piece is available too? No, this piece is sold. Oh. But if somebody wants one, I'd be glad to make another. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah. you've heard them. You know where to find it. What's your website, Roger? Uh, Stratum Wood. Dot com. And and I'm on Instagram on Stratum Wood Studios and Facebook on Stratum Wood Studios. Okay, awesome. All right. Check it out. All right. All right. Thanks, you Thanks guys. Thanks very much. All right. Good to see you. All right. Take care. All right. Most of you have heard me talk about this guy. He's actually influenced me a lot in the some of the stylings of my own work. Whenever I talk about pillowing surfaces, and I've also shared that he was influenced a lot by Jerry Osgood, the infamous Ted Blatchley. And Ted has an awesome uh, small chest here uh, in this exhibit and curly maple. And Ted, you gotta tell me more about this piece. What, why these dimensions? And what was the inspiration to build it the way you did? Well, uh, this is a commission piece, so it really started with uh, space in uh, a, a person's house, a very good friend in this case. And uh, we went in and, and, it, and measured and talked about different types of wood. And um, I did a series of sketches. So the size um, was, we arrived at pretty quickly. And, um, and then as for the wood, uh, I happen to have some of this, this is curly soft maple. You might call it uh, tiger maple because the, the broad 
uh, figuring there. Mm. Uh, sometimes when the when the curly maple is very tight grained, it, it, it's known as fiddleback. Mm -hmm. So um, I had some planks that just worked out really well. Uh, and uh, some of the material was resawn. Are we getting into technical? Uh, sure. Yeah. What, for the drawer fronts, for those the drawer fronts. Yeah, they're actually um, made from a piece of two two inch uh, oh, maple, nice. and it was split down the middle. So when you get that, yeah, you have similar grain patterns mm -hmm. when you op open it up, and. Uh, yeah, so the, I split up some of that material. Yeah, those fronts, all right. I was just admiring how rich those are with figure, and even your drawer dividers are incredibly figured. Yeah, there's, it's an important part of the process once you're sawing out the wood, uh, you know, delegating where it's going to go in a piece, mm -hmm. and then actually laying it out uh, for where, what drawer front goes where, and yeah. what gets used for legs. So it's, it's and, a really important part of the process. And what someone notices with your pieces is that there's really no flat surfaces. Yeah, uh, it's something I've I've done uh, early on. I started doing that from looking at the work of uh, Sam Maloof. Was very uh, his work was shape. Mm -hmm. But what it does, wood has a very powerful uh, pull on people, and people, you've seen people come in and they want to touch it. And so this softness uh, of pillowing is, is shaped on a lot of the surfaces, and it, uh, it reflects light different than a flat yeah. surface. And, uh, um, yeah, and it sure. makes it nice to touch, you know, and whenever you're building a piece, you also want to make the undersides just just as smooth as the uh, upper sections. Yeah, and this top edge has a nice under round over there. It's not even it's hand shaped. It's, it's not hand a shaped. Yeah, I uh, I may start with some router work to suggest it, but I I'm not opposed to just picking up a plane and spoke yep. shave and rasps and uh, you know shaping and what about these poles these well these are uh, through tenon joinery uh, mm -hmm. so there's a tenon that goes straight through the drawer front and uh, there's wedges that are driven into sawn slots and the back side of the mortise is actually wider mm. than the front so when you drive the wedges in, you, you spread the wood, and that pull will not come out. They won't be um, coming out. <laughs> so what um, what wood did you use there? This is uh, some old growth cherry that I've had laying around the oh, shop. Oh wow! When I first saw it, I thought it was walnut, but it's cherry. Yeah, it was just very some very dark material that I wow. had from another project. That's uh, nice. And an interesting aspect to this is they're the last, uh, and I guess it's the case with a lot of furniture, they're the last things that actually go in. Mm -hmm. And so I have this drawer completed, I have it finished, the finish is on there, and then I'm able to take it over to, I have a, a horizontal slot mortiser. I've set it up on that, and I... Uh, oh, that's when you put the mortise that, in? That, that's when I buzz the mortise, oh, and wow. I may lay it out first with a knife to delineate the size of the hole that's going to be in, in here, the, the hole meaning mortise. <laughs> But um, it's a really exciting part of the process. I know. I didn't think you'd have the finish on, but wow, I can see well, it why. Makes, yeah, it makes sense because if you were to come back and, and finish later, it'd be hard to yeah, you know, get it all in there. Uh, yeah, spread it around. But. So someone mentioned to you that this had similarities or reflections of shaker furniture. Well, that was a really nice compliment. Uh, David Lamb made that uh, compliment, and uh, I never had really thought about that. But there's really nothing earth shaking about the design. It's a simple chest of drawers. Yes, it has some curves on the surfaces and lines, but. Um, there are, are shaker chests of drawers that you know retain that simplicity, and uh, yeah. so I was, you know, to have someone like David make that compliment, and uh, 
uh, felt good and, and something I hadn't really thought of. Yeah, I hadn't either. When I looked at it, and said, sure, yeah. But when you come up to it, you can see there's a lot more going on than your typical shaker piece. Yeah. So it's super sweet. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate you showing that to us, Ted. Yeah. Thank you so sure. much. Thanks, Tom. Right now, right? We're getting some raking light on the carving. It looks awesome. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Time of day is changing. Huh? Yeah. So we have a treat here. We've got a piece by Jeff Cooper. And when I first met Jeff, his, his work, he would do lots of uh, almost like whimsical carving for children's seating. That was just one aspect of it. And then he, since that time, he's done quite a few furniture pieces where he's included carving details. So well, what do you it, got here, it's Jeff? interesting that your first thought was about the whimsy, the older pieces, because there are some jokes embedded in this. Yeah. Yeah, one of which I can show you down here is that I turned Alice in Wonderland into Alice in Disneyland. Okay. Disneyland, right? <laughs> okay. I got it. Because I didn't want to have to spell it out with all oh, those right. letters. I said, how am I going to shorten this? That's awesome. Um, Beautiful relief carving, though. Are there other shelves full of thematics, like the kind of... Well, there are. I mean, I books? substitute here. This is like a pie. This is a section of Guernica. And I did do themes mm -hmm. on it. You know, so this is all, you know, War and Peace. In, uh, there's a thematic thing here between 1491 and 93 and tied together with The Art of War, which is an incredible book. This is my, you know, the, the mocking book, what's it, um, social justice page with I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, and this is uh, Strange Fruit, Billie Holiday's song. So, you know, Don Quixote there and kind of a random collection at the bottom. There was a lot of thought went into which pieces to, you know, what books to include. Mm -hmm. And I left one here deliberately blank so that whoever is looking at it can fill in all the books that I left out that they were thinking of. <laughs> uh, I That's would, awesome. you know, say, you know, beyond that, I mean, there's books on the other side and, and books on the end. Mm. There's a, a, you know, you know there's all kinds of different things, thematic. So you've got a combination of woods. Yeah, so I have walnut and cherry, and the sides on the drawers is red oak. Mm -hmm. And the bottoms on the drawers is the walnut offcuts with all the sapwood, mm -hmm. rather than waste it yeah. to make beautiful bottoms. The, I, I've done quite a number of pieces with this combination of woods for uh, Andrew Schirmeister with you know his spider series and everything and and this leg is a design that I've been using a lot which is inspired by the columns at the Sagrada Familia church in um, in Barcelona with the tapering up like tree like and I always find there's a lot of emphasis you know on making things light with the taper down and a light foot and I'm thinking just the opposite because with the heavy on the bottom and tapering up then it really makes it sit on the ground and mm -hmm. it's like rising up from the ground oh, really, rather than yeah. floating and I think stylistically that's one of the things that you'll yeah see in, in yeah it a feels lot more grounded mind. for sure so there was a particular challenge I mean the idea was to make a combination unit and there was a particular challenge figuring out the joinery, how to make the two sides yeah. merge together. Mm -hmm. Because all in here um, is how do the tenons bypass each other? Where do the panels go? What level they go on? Right. How do I make this a flush surface here mm -hmm. and here so that the books leaning on the side wall are on a flush surface rather? And so there's a lot of thinking going into yeah, a little engineering in there into, yeah because sure. the tenants had to kind of bypass each other because this is at a different level than that mm -hmm. in order to make it flush beautiful is this piece spoken for is it no for? this one is for sale so how can people find out more about you on what's your website i do have a website it's cooperwoodsculptor.com cooperwoodsculptor.com but you check it out do you have some of those pictures of the hippos and they're all on the website all right they're all on the website nice. i've been in the last several years doing some public art pieces using these relief carvings 
So I have a section on my website about the public art. Um, most recently was at the Lakes Region Community College where I did a big mural about for the automotive school. That is awesome. Yeah, you've done a number of pieces like that in libraries. And, yeah, um, in some hospitals. Yeah, it does yeah. bring a lot of cheer, joy to people to see that relief carving. The cool thing with the relief carving is you were saying over here, when the light comes at it from the side, then boom, it yeah. really pops yeah, all, exactly. the effort, all the effort you put into it. Yeah, we're right really throughout. seeing that right now on this piece. Well, thank you so much. All right, pleasure. Time to show pleasure. It. Here we've got Liz Grace, and she built a cabinet to house violin. So talk about an open slate for creativity. But I'm going to let Liz explain the inspiration and the practical execution of this piece. Sure. Um, I am a beginner fiddle player, and I've been playing fiddle for about a year and a half, and I'm really enjoying it. It's an amazing instrument. And I was inspired to try to create a piece that was capturing that sense of flow and energy of music that you enter into when you're learning to play or when you're playing an instrument. Yeah. So uh, the shape of the cabinet reflects the shape of the violin body. Beautiful. And I wanted all the elements to echo what was happening, or what the elements of a violin. So these are cello tuning pegs. So these are ebony. I wondered that because they, they were so large. I'm like, yeah. I wonder what instrument they came from. Um, they came from a luthier who has been working for years, and he just had a, a handful of these. And nice. I chose a couple that I wanted. That's awesome. He also supplied, um, these are rosewood tuning pegs from violins for the mm -hmm. bow hangers. And um, all the coloration, the brown, the black, the silver, is echoing what's going on here, mm. the brown, black, and the silver of the strings. Mm -hmm. And this little inlay here in the This bottom. little silver inlay is uh, my maker's mark. Um, oh, nice. And so that's, that's in there. It's actually argentinium, so it won't tarnish. It's a, fa it's a silver family, oh, but it's, it's argentinium. So. Hmm. I chose sapile. Uh, if you look at the sides, the ribbon sides of the sapile, mm -hmm. there's a lot of action in the grain of sapile. And yeah. to me, that was giving it this tremendous sense of energy and flow. And also, if you think about it, the lines of the sapile echo, if you were to turn it horizontally, a musical staff. The oh, lines right. Of a musical staff. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was speaking to me of music in that way. The legs. You, you get the surprise when you look down. When you look feet. down. The feet um, are double curved. Again, I wanted this sense of flow and energy. Um, the feet mm -hmm. themselves are actual violin scrolls. Mm. And the banding is a silver band around each one. So where'd you get those scrolls? Did you have to make those yourself? So very graciously, Vermont Violin provided me with four violin necks, random violin necks that were test pieces. And I took them and I cut them oh, apart nice. and modified them so that I could use them as feet. Beautiful job. Yeah. So many thanks to Vermont Violin for uh, giving me those. So this is going to be in your home. You're not making it available for... Oh, it's for sale. Oh, okay. It's certainly for sale. <laughs> oh, good. And if you want the violin with it, you may have the violin with it. <laughs> so how can people see more of your work? You... Sure. Uh, Rivers Bend Woodworking is my website and my company name. So they can go to my website or just give me a call. Uh, my phone number is on the website. Rivers Bend, is that in New Hampshire? Rivers Bend Woodworking is located in Plymouth, New Hampshire, just off of Main Street. Oh, nice. Yep. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Bye bye. This next guy, I didn't have to travel far to find because he's my neighbor. Dave has an amazing piece here tonight, and I want to let him share it. But it is in the classic uh, lamb style of finely carved detail and exquisite. Um, influence from period furniture. So Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about this beautiful piece. Isn't this a sideboard? The, well, I'm calling, calling it a, it? I'm calling it a serving table. Serving table. Beautiful. It's, it's a commission piece. Um, it was supposed to be less than a sideboard, more like a serving table, but size-wise it's like a sideboard without all the cabinetry. And one thing that the um, clients wanted was a shelf down below, so that was integrated. Um, and actually, the whole design process was 
uh, a couple of discussions. So it, you know, listen to what their thinking was along with some of my ideas. And so we quickly settled on this uh, formula of basically a table with a few drawers and the shelf. Mm -hmm. And then the legs came into play as, because the house is a federal style house. Yeah. I wanted a table that fit that overall sensibility and was able to use my carving um, techniques into this table and asked um, Sarah, the, one of the owners, what she likes to grow, what's one of her favorite flowers, and it was, happened to be the iris. So the iris is the, is the motif for the carving. Oh, so beautiful. each leg has a couple of iris in them. Each leg is a little different, although it's based on pretty much the same format, but I tried to change it up so that each leg would be unique. So that was the carving detail, um, and I'm brushing over that because there's an awful lot of work into carving a leg like this. Yeah, for sure. Um, but then also to make a, a shelf like this that appears like it, it floats, mm -hmm. yet has very delicate um, superstructure to support it properly, yet looks delicate mm. at the same time. Yeah. So it's a complex piece. Actually, the, the table case itself was made as like a big box, mm -hmm. and then the legs were attached. Yep. As opposed to having the leg, uh, the aprons tenon into the right. leg. Oh, okay. It's beautiful. And though. then the top is Cuban mahogany veneer. Yeah, let's look at that. That's just that one width cutting of a veneer. Looks awesome in this light. Look at that. We kind of focus on the knot, which is kind of fun. A lot of people would cut that out, but I thought that was just yeah. a wonderful part of the story of the tree. Yeah. You know, so I, I purposefully left that and then let the, the rest of the tree just kind of... I love how you Show leave it, story. like, because it's it, it does have so much character, and a lot of people think of it as a flaw, but it's kind of bold to leave it and just say, "No, that's yeah. the real deal." That's the real deal. <laughs> that's beautiful. And this finish, you were just telling me, uh, not sprayed, but it's a brush. Brush. Done. It's a brush. You we use a three-inch brush. It's a beautiful one thing. stroke at a time. And it's that uh, tongue oil. It's it is uh, Waterlocks. I guess it's a tongue oil-based varnish. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And you rubbed Six it out. Six coats. Wow. Yeah, I know. But no, it uh, it looks amazing. Well, you know, you rub it and you think you're just about done. Say, oh, oh yeah. Rub through. Yeah, you have one little. It drives you nuts. And so then you put another coat. But I noticed that the drawers slide impeccably. Oh, of course. Beautiful joinery. That nice, sweet little detail. cock beating. Cock yeah. beating and it's yeah. nice and crisp and gives it nice definition. Yeah, look at how it gives it that reflective line. Just sets it off a little more. This was pretty complicated. The geometry with these central legs because they are at an mm -hmm. angle they sort of parallel oh, yeah. this line yeah right intersect with that so oh yeah where to enter the leg there yeah it's it was a series of questions that you had to kind of go through and mm -hmm. looks awesome and the, and the feet you turned and and the feet are turned and applied separately and then to the whole leg um before they're carved it's the only and splash of what maple curly maple yeah yep. beautiful yeah well, once again, you did it, Dave. Well, thanks, Tom. Thing of beauty. Thanks, Tom. So it's already sold. It's already sold. It's going to live in Canterbury, which is nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. You can visit whenever you want. Yeah. Yeah. So if people want to find out more about the infamous David Lamb, Canada Maker, is that the website? You go to David Lamb Furniture. Okay, David Lamb Furniture. Okay, yeah, check it all out. All right, Dave, thanks so much. Thanks. We've got another special guest here. This is Brad Walcott, and he's actually an instructor down at North Bennett Street School. And we've got the honor of hearing about his latest work. This is your latest work, right? It is the most recent. piece. Yep. Um, I just love the design of them. Uh, it looks like 
curly maple, but an imaginative design. Where did you come up with that? So these pieces are actually a follow-on to a piece I did about 10 years ago uh, for the Smile Building here in Concord that you incorporated motifs from David's machines. Um, because it was the, originally the John White um, oh, foundry. Yeah. And so if you look at the, the spiral pattern here, um, that pattern, that motif is present in a lot of the um, cast iron hand wheels on the machines. Right. And um, I, I was inspired by that motif, and I just love the, the arrangement of it. And But it brings in a lot of the natural elements that I use in a lot of my work. And so... There's that industrial basis for it, but it also has that natural, you know, starfish mm -hmm. appearance. And with the curly maple, it's like the light coming down through the water and hitting it, mm -hmm. and it's sort of the glass tops um, serve a, a functional purpose, but um, don't hide, you know, the design and the work. Um, so that was the inspiration for yeah. it. And, uh, Did you give this these a name? I did. They don't have a name. You're not yet. supposed to give names. I do. <laughs> I guess that's why I, I remember looking in the book and it said no name. Yeah. I was thinking like they well, reminded me of starfish yeah. or something, but but that that swirl pattern. Yeah. I think that was crazy to use that from uh, industrial machinery because I've seen that and thought, why would they go to that length for just a simple handle? Right. right. But it was for the decorative aspect, right? There yeah. was no practical. Dave, you know, right? David told me that there was a. Um, Back at that point, the castings, if they used straight spokes, they were more prone to breaking. Oh, yeah. And that there was some sort of stress reduction in the serpentine form sure. that allowed the, 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 the wheels to be stronger. Yeah. And, um, and there certainly is a decorative that element, too, because they're beautifully yeah. made. Um, that does make sense when you look at it. How about getting this joint right here in the center? <laughs> you have to have these five elements come in and meet perfectly and I'm getting really close and I don't see any gaps. <laughs> How'd you pull that off? So I used um, two sacrificial blocks that I uh, glued to the top and bottom of the forms after they were um, shaped. I actually carved the profile of the bottom into the bottom of the block so that I can glue it in place and um, then I used uh, hose clamps on the top and bottom to hold the, the joints together. Because of the, the, the serpentine shape, if you tried to run straps nice. around the outside, it would twist the, yes. the forms off. So you need that pressure from the clamping to be driving right towards the mm -hmm. center. And so the, the sacrificial blocks that were carefully put on so that the band would apply pressure equally on each one um, allowed me to like get the pressure on and, uh, and adjust it and gave me a little bit of wiggle room so I could get everything lined up. Yeah, um, beautiful. How about the joint here? You got like a 45. Yeah, yeah. Here. So I actually used a, a loose tenon in there. Yeah. I, I went back and forth. Um, using a loose tenon allowed me to just have a lot more glue surface and a lot more. Um, if I had used a regular tenon, um, it would have been more prone to coming apart because that miter would be pushing it away from, right. like out of the mortise. Right. Um, and so I didn't think it was the best, no. um, the best method. And there's not much material there to work with. And I was worried that over time, uh, using like a standard tenon or just like a standard spline would um, basically work itself loose yeah. under pressure. So uh, yeah, so I use a loose tenon that's perpendicular to the, the miter. Worked really well. So. And all your surfaces are beautifully pillowed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. You know, I wanted to keep that organic feel to it and um, it doesn't take much to take away that that the sharpness. Yeah. Um, You've got a natural a finish. Of, Is that an oil finish or it's a, a shell like, it's shellac. Shellac. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, That's all it takes so. to bring out all that life. Yeah. No. I mean, and on on maple in a situation when like this where you have a glass top on it and you don't have to worry about the exposure to to heat or or liquids. You, there's no concern about the shellac being damaged by right. use, and yeah. so that allowed me. And I love it on maple; it really keeps it light and clean, and sure. you know, doesn't um, 
yellow it as much as in a like an oil based finish. And yeah. I toyed around with bleaching them, mm -hmm. um, and really, and then using a water based uh, uh, water white finish to mm -hmm. to finish them, and th that would be a different look. And I could certainly see doing something like that in the future. And I also. You know, using that same motif, you could use a um, a gilding process or like a, a gold paint to create a cool effect there. So those are all the the thoughts that were going through my head when I was considering how to finish yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, they're just really spectacular, beautiful always. job. So are these sold? Or no, these not yet. These are speculative pieces for the show. Beautiful. And. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to um, get them up to Bar Harbor um, nice. to the gallery. I think they'd be a natural um, fit for that. Yeah, up with Tim Coleman's cabinet. Yeah. I guess that's going up there. Yeah. So, how can people find out more about you and see other? Uh, my my website work? is bradwolcott.com. Brad um, Wolcott. Or, yep. Or you can find it through the Furniture Masters website. Yep. Uh, in the in the list of artists. Awesome. So. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very I really much. I really enjoyed hearing about that piece. Thank you. So we've got another treat, Aspen Golan. And where do you live? You're always traveling around, but where do it's you actually true. live? I just officially moved to Rollinsford, New Hampshire. Okay. So that's where I'm at. All right, great. Yeah. Well, Aspen has a number of pieces. She had an article in Fine Woodworking recently on making brushes. Uh, you may have seen that, but we want to talk to her <laughs> right now about this beautiful mantel clock she's made and tell us about the design and how you made it, some of the significance there. Oh yeah, well, I mean, it's a really sort of fun blend of super traditional and contemporary furniture making in that it's basically formally an Eli Terry shelf clock. Mm -hmm. So all of this sort of exterior work is all hyper traditional. And then this internal panel um, is a custom design that I made and it's hand painted using glass enamels. Beautiful. Which is like this really cool process where it's essentially like vitrified glass. So it's like crushed glass that's pigmented and you paint it on and fire it in a kiln and so it, it you can see it's just vitrified comes, yeah is that's what's that process is crushing it or heating it so it heats up enough that it basically becomes this like jelly like substance and then as it cools it basically so the, the substrate of the glass also becomes jelly like and then they basically fuse completely oh. and so they can never be like scratched off or removed wow yeah it's awesome it's painting with glass and then this is a hand painted dial as well if you look closely you can see my like little brush marks oh my god <laughs> Wow, you really went to great lengths. That looks Yeah, awesome. I mean, why not, right? Yeah. If you're going to make a piece of furniture from scratch, you might yeah. as well go for it. So the so contemporary yeah. aspect is the painting, would you yeah. say? And and tell us about that. What does that mean? Well, the idea was sort of playing with the idea that the clock has a relationship to the human body. So mm -hmm. we have a clock face. Mm -hmm. And then, so basically what I did was use the rest of the clock as a body. So if this is the face, then this is like the rest of the portrait. And so it's playing off of this idea of portraiture, using this as a frame, but also so sort of like this sitter is like encased within the clock. So yeah, it's this play between like the physical body and the furniture. And then this sort of contemporary approach of like sort of feminist approach to woodworking and yeah. furniture making in terms of thinking about like the role that women play in a household yeah. and sort of encompassing that into a piece of furniture. Is she, is she like trapped in time? It's like is a little... <laughs> Well, like you we all are in a way, right? Well, yeah. Is it like is she is this a portrait or is she sort of like trapped inside yeah. this clock? And yeah. it's the same. It's sort of that same experience of like is a woman sort of you know the is the house your dominion or is it a cage? Right. And it's right. both. It's what you make of it, right? <laughs> So yeah, what, so, what just, about, so what are you going to say? Oh, just like being an underrepresented person in the field, it's like yeah. you do start to think about it every time you're in the shop. Yeah. You know, and so then all of a sudden it's like being a woman starts playing into the type of work that I make and like makes me think about, I'm thinking about it constantly when I'm yeah. in the wood shop. And so, yeah, it started becoming part of my work. Well, it's just beautiful work independent of whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate really that. <laughs> so what about, um, what kind of wood did you use on the frame? Here? It's all rosewood. Nice. Yeah, so it was a donation made to North Bennett Street School by some someone who retired from the field, and he had a bunch of this gorgeous rosewood left over, and he gave it to us. 
and then they sort of parcel it out to students when they're getting more advanced and they have a good proposal for it. So I chose it because it really blends with the stylization of the dress, you know, so she kind of, again, blends into this. The pleated dress, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So did you make this while you were at at North Bennett? Yeah, it was one of my last projects when I was at North Bennett, yeah. That must have been a big hit. It was really fun. And then this part, I actually, like, North Bennett didn't have any sort of setup for me to do glass enameling, so I had to go and teach myself how to do that elsewhere. Wow. And so I did that over one of our breaks and then came back and installed it. So woodworking is not enough. you got to do a little I enameling. I, like, love but all the things. <laughs> That's cool, though. Did you make this key? I did. You did? Yeah. Oh, my God. I was just joking. Let me check yeah. it out. And I made the hinges, too. Wow. That's yeah. insane. So, you know, I mean, sometimes things just get that you have to get highly custom. There aren't knife hinges small enough, so I just had to make them. Oh, my gosh. So what do you make? Where do you do that kind of work? Oh, that I just, like, filed at my bench. Oh, nice. Yeah. Right in North Bennett. Yeah. People looked over you like a mad scientist. Yeah. And you're just, like, <laughs> filing, and you're like, how did I get here? Oh why am gosh. I doing this? But you, you love it, so that's why. I know. Yeah. And you do a lot of teaching lately, Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I've been traveling and teaching a lot, and I'm going to go international for the first time this year, so that'll be really Ooh. fun. Over yeah. Europe? Going to Australia and Japan. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Wow, that's intense. I know. It's going to be a lot of time on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how do people um, find you and see more about your work? And I mean, my website, but I do a lot of posting on Instagram. I think okay. it's like the easiest way to sort of see, I don't know, see the inside of my shop. Yeah, yeah. You know, not just the finished product. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Oh, my God. For Thanks for that. having me. That's cool. Yeah. Great job. But I can't believe you actually made the key. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I was joking around. Yeah. Here we are with probably the finest master for exquisite details in the Furniture Masters. Guy I've known a long while, I guess. and 20 years. Yeah. Good friend and amazing maker. You've probably seen his books and his many articles in Fine Woodworking. But he travels the world, and we want to share this special piece that he's made, very influenced from a trip to Spain. So, Garrett, Garrett Hack. Garrett, take it away. Show hey, us Hey, thank piece. you, Tom. Um, not only influenced in Spain, made in Spain. Woo. And it's called España, which is Spain. So it's all Spanish woods. I was there teaching a class, and it originated from the idea of teaching case construction. So you're teaching case construction, you want to make a case, a miniature case, a study piece is what I like to call it. So it's a chestnut that they, it grows there, a sweet chestnut. As a matter of fact, we would pick up chestnuts on the road and roast them. And uh, this is some very, very like dense pine. It was a timber. That's like five pieces across there. It doesn't look like yeah. it, but it is. And then inside is a little drawer made of olive wood, which obviously so sweet. they have in Spain. And then oh, that's awesome. um, sycamore, which is not Spanish. Wow. And then Engelmann spruce, which is a instrument wood. Uh, uh, very, very uh, beautiful, tight-grained wood. That is such a little yeah. jewel, that it drawer. Is. And so, then, have you made many drawer sides with sycamore? Is yeah. That? I mean, when it's that small, it's fun to do it out of it's, that. And it's so beautiful with that quarter song. It is. Speckling. It, is. it makes it worth it. Yeah. So you see these little beads. That's sort of yeah. one of the things that I like to play I with. That. And then the panels raise a little bit on the back side, but mostly Ooh. it's on the front side. Oh, a double raise. Yeah, a double raise. You can just barely see it. That's sweet. Yeah, I can yeah. see it. Very Shellac soft. finish. Yeah. And then the little bead runs around the door. That's a little mm-hmm. sort of a highlight. And then the top is this ebonized... Uh, cherry, probably. I forget what I made it out of. It could have been pear. Mm-hmm. And then abalone, which is something I've always been curious about. So I'm cutting these little pieces out wow. of shells. And, and you did it. all that in Spain? No, I did that when I got home. When you got home? I made the case in Spain. Yeah. And then this awesome. is sort of sort of a, a memory of the trip. Yeah. Spanish sky at night. So these little stars and sort of moonlight. Maybe clouds, I don't know. And then this is sort of the landscape. That's awesome. With some little light. You always have like these little surprises on fun. the sides. Yeah. And, then, and this little thing is kind of makes you crazy because oh you have to gosh. you have to start on a black and end on a black. Oh yeah. And then it's a solid back. Yep. Uh, three, two pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, shiplap together in a certain way, so it doesn't come through the joint there when you bevel it. Nice. And all these nice little dados. Yeah. Well, those are yeah, those little dados, and this is a little sliding dovetail, and these are two little sliding dovetails. So it's an interesting case oh, construction. Sweet. 
you know, the top is, um, the top sliding dovetail means that this can't warp and the mm -hmm. top can't warp. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And then this ties it together. And then these just basically are just, they can go into dados because there's not much stress on them. Mm -hmm. So it's a fun piece, you know, it's a small fun piece. That what do you do with it? I don't piece. know. Yeah, what about... Um, That's you, ivory. You, you hang it up and admire it and say, yeah. I have a Garrett Hack piece yeah. right here. You know, I have one of these, a similar one, and I always love going by it. And Sometimes I open it and look at the drawers. There's two drawers in that one, one on top of the other. Yeah, but the closer you get to your pieces, the more little discoveries that are made, and that's so I, satisfying. I like that idea. Yeah. I know that you can see it from across the room, but when you get close, you start to see, like that double bevel or mm -hmm. you know, this or mm -hmm. whatever. But, um, you know, it's not a fine, fine piece, but it's a nice, small piece. Oh, it's an amazing little study. So is this piece um, available? It's available. It is. It um, says it's $3,500, which is a steal. I believe it. I know the amount of time that goes into that, but more than that, the years of yeah. skill and, and your own little way of doing things yeah. is there. Wow. So someone could actually acquire this piece. They can I mean, acquire. if they act fast. They can. They but can. where do people find you to find out more about you? GarrettHack.com. GarrettHack.com. He was here at a, at a weekend we just had and showed his portfolio. And I'm telling you, at the end, I was newly inspired. I swear, I was. I, I got to, like, not to maybe do exactly the same thing, but Get there's back something the about seeing beautiful work and the way people work that just charges you up again in a certain it's, it's way. It's still fun for me. I got to say, I still yeah. love it. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much hey. for spending some time with us here. Our next special guest <laughs> is Richard O'Dell. He's a, a gifted two-career man, and it, you'd never know it by the accomplishments he's made in furniture. But I want to talk to Richard about this beautiful piece, Walnut Table, but I know very little about it. So why don't you tell us more about it, Richard? So where this comes from is it's, it's related to this, this leg form, which is uh, sort of glommed on to the side of whatever it is that I'm dealing with. I've done this a number of times. Um, and I really like the way that this sort of feels like a part of the, a part of the overall um, piece without, without really digging into the piece mm -hmm. markedly. But the, the decoration on it is, is the fascinating part because really it's all gold leaf hmm. um, and it's all carved. So I'm carving through the finished surface and then gold leafing on top of that. And it's all, it's all about um, sort of a, a celestial feeling, a feeling mm. of where do, the, where do these things come from? Where are, they, where are they headed? And they come around the corner and sort of disappear. Um, but this, this particular one is a writing desk for me. Oh, really? I have never made myself a piece of furniture. Oh, is that right? I mean, it, in 25 years of making furniture, I've never made myself a piece. Oh, my God. So this is, this is for a, a very specific place in my own, in my own house. And it's where, I, it's where I plan on finishing off my writing. Oh, that's awesome. Which so you've great. got a drawer on the other side? Drawer on the other side. It's uh, the nice. drawer on the other side is really hand, is really uh, oh it's dovetailed. It actually has a um, it actually has of course I have a a nice uh, thing, but it's a it's a curly maple. Ooh. A actually, it's a uh, it's a quilted maple oh, yeah. piece. Wow, you don't see that I had for the bottom of it. Uh, no, I you know and and I had the quilted maple. Um, sitting on the shelf, and I had it for 15 years, and I never had a chance to put it anywhere. Oh, nice! And now I have well, a now chance. You get to look I at can it. open this up, and I can say, "Oh, isn't that just great?" And you can, and you can tell yourself, "I did it. I yeah. used that curly maple." <laughs> Finally, that's awesome. So, and, and and so all of this is uh, all of this is stuff that you know. There are a whole bunch of joinery details and everything that only a furniture maker could love. Yeah. But it's little things like, like the miters coming to three-point corners and yeah. things like that. Oh, right. Just make, just make a difference to me and no one else. Yeah. 
That's incredible. Well, so this is a personal piece that you probably thought about a lot and thinking about the scale. How long had you been had this in the mind to make for yourself? You know, I'd had it in mind to make for myself for a long time, but never had the design. And so it, it always got to the back burner. Mm -hmm. And then it it had come up to the top and it'd go into the back burner because I could never figure out exactly where it was going. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, sometime this summer, I said, ah, this is how it's going to work. <laughs> well, it looks spectacular. It's really, I love the way you join the legs. And to hear your explanation of them not kind of breaking into the surface as much it makes sense. But uh, beautiful job. So this is not available, unlike some of the other pieces we've no, talked about tonight. Luck. This is mine. Not for sale. <laughs> it's priceless. But if someone wanted to see more of your work, where would they go? They'd go to uh, finefurnituremaster.com. Finefurnituremaster.com. Thank you so much, Richard, for showing us that. I really enjoyed seeing the piece. Thanks, Tom. This is a pleasure. All right, All right our next guest is a 14, 15 year member of the Furniture Masters. I don't get to see him much because he's down in Massachusetts, right near the coast, right? Across that border. Yeah. Yeah, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Oh, yeah, it's a good fishing town. Uh, but John does amazing work. Uh, it, not reflected on this piece that we're about to show you, he does some incredible engraving metal type work that I don't understand but I love to look at it. So I'll share it with you his website at the end, you can do that. But this time we have these tables that have an Asian influence, but I'm gonna let John tell us more about them. They look to be in cherry, but what, tell they us about They are this. indeed in cherry. There's a book matched pair. Um, nice. They are more than an Asian influence. I rarely make reproduction woodwork. But this is the rare example of an exact reproduction of the Ming Dynasty uh, table. What is inexact is that it's in cherry, and the original Ming Dynasty work would have been in Wangwali, which is a rosewood from the Chinese uh, region south of China, Hainan mm. Island kind of thing. A friend brought a real one into my shop some years ago. It kind of floored me. Um, he wanted unknowing um, sanding sort of restoration done. I put the foot down on that <laughs> and used those tables as a, um, that table as a vehicle to get to meet the curator of Asian art at the Peabody Essex Museum and in an attempt to see whether it was a real piece or not. Oh. What she told me was that it looks it, the wood's right, but you won't be able to know until you take the piece apart. Oh. So I was a little nervous, but she told me, don't worry, we do this all the time. I took it back to the shop, flipped it upside down, and got out a block of wood and a hammer and started tapping. These pieces were not glued together. Hmm. The Ming Dynasty was done in 1644, I think, and 55, I don't know, before epoxy. <laughs> So there weren't glues that were up to the challenge of adhering um, oily rosewoods. So they came up with this amazing system of interlocking joinery that tied the components together. Um, I took the piece apart on my bench. The joinery was correct, which in this woman, Nancy Berliner's, mind meant that it was indeed a real Ming Dynasty piece. And then the light went off in my head. Oh, <laughs> make a copy. So I oh, made a copy. Yeah. Um, Are you going to take this without a little bit without measuring? And that um, actually was a real door opener for me. It was a lesson in Chinese joinery. It got me on my first cover on the back of Fine Woodworking magazine. And it's a piece that I brought to my first meeting with the Furniture Masters, which kind of acted as a um, lever to pry open that door. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the pieces, like I said, they, they just kind of come oh up my apart gosh, with a little fixing. Gorgeous. There's some, I did cheat, and then I used power tools where I can. Sure. But, you know, these okay, tenons yeah. are live tenons. Come on in here. These live tenons um, have to be shoulder plane fit to make everything work. This joint is the annoying joint I was taught in woodworking school that I thought I'd never use. It's hidden dovetails inside of a miter. 
but it's an apron piece that's not attached to the top of the table, so that's the only way um, I think it can go on without glue, and it's certainly the way it was done in Imperial China. That's amazing. Um, the top is quarter inch thick, mm -hmm. five sixteenths maybe. The top and the shelf are thin. They're let into small little, you know, dados, rabbits, or dados rather, in the frame. And to keep them flat, I love this, is ingenious. This, these cross members, one on the shelf, two on the top, they are sliding dovetail let oh, into the gosh. bottom of the top, bottom wow. of the shelf. So you can't push up on these That's great. panels. They're, they're only a quarter down. inch thick, you say? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, yeah you can so see. It's about it. an eighth inch dovetail or so? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Take a look. Oh, wow. That's look maybe that. more. Is that five sixteenths? No, that's a touch over, yeah, yeah, but not much. Yeah. The first one. We're nerding out here. Sorry. The first one I tried to make very accurately. This the second pair have been made because Fine Woodworking wanted an article on the making of these. So I slightly altered my um, design to include um, imperial measurements. And the original ones were not made in metric system. They were made in a Chinese system that included chu, which chu I forget the other chu and fen and there's another term. Something similar to a foot, listen, um, imperial uh, measurement people, a foot divided into 10 instead of 12. Okay. So your math gets as easy as the metric math, yet you still have the foot, the right. best of both worlds. Right. And these other components all come apart. These wow. legs um, grab this spandrel in a clothespin-like fashion and they're tenoned into the bottom of this mm. frame so the clothespin is held and the spandrel uh, has a sliding dovetail on one side. Now if you take this circle that is the leg mm -hmm. and cut a chunk out of it, you get half of that sliding dovetail for free because mm -hmm. the angles of the round where they meet that cavity are about right for the dovetail. Mm -hmm. So you have to make the one half of the dovetail, but not the other. Yeah. It's the probably the only time-saving part of the whole piece. Wow! But so this that's whole thing, that. you could take it completely apart and lay it out on the floor, and it'd all yep. be there. Yep. That's amazing. Yep. Um, it's ingenious, really, that they well, each it component display. holds the other one. Kind yeah. Of thing. There's only one way to take it apart. Right. And therefore, you start, put it back together. You start with the top, like you did. That's yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. The top can come apart of its own, yeah. but then then the rest of it starts to come apart. Yeah. These shelf um, stretchers are a maddening fit because they're a tenon that has a very um, tricky coped shoulder. So mm. that's work done with an in-canal gouge, which is a wonderful tool, but mad maddeningly frustrating to sharpen. Yeah. But the perfect tool for the job. Also the tool that makes the mortise for the top of the leg. That's awesome. So tell me, uh, what do you remember the issue number you were on the back cover of Fine Woodworking with those chairs, ago. right? Oh, that, I've been on twice. Yeah, and, the and, chairs. Um, the chair. Th these were on before that. These were on. Yeah, so, one. Oh, one nice. One in Paducah. Oh, great. So that sometime do you remember that? Five, oh, five, maybe. I don't, okay. but I can find that. Okay. Quickly. Uh, and I don't know the number of the chair, yeah. but I do know that a piece with significant engraving on it should be in the next issue, the back cover. Oh, great. So, hat trick. Wow. <laughs> so, check that out. A three-time back cover of Fine Woodworking Magazine. Got my hat trick. I mean, that's better than the cover of Rolling Stone, right? Well, I'm a musician, I too, so I might push Oh, yeah, back you on. might want that, yeah. <laughs> well, this is just amazing. So if people want to see more of your work other than the back of Fine Woodworking, where do they go? Yeah, johncameroncabinetmaker.com. All right, well, wow, I'm just blown away. I didn't realize it came apart, and just to hear you talk about it added so much. So thank you so much for that. And we'll Enjoyed talking about it. All Thanks, right, everyone. Man. And this is a, a great maker in the Furniture Masters. You had a lot to do with organizing this exhibit, I think. So Definitely. A lot it, of behind-the-scenes work. For yeah, sure. so thank yeah. you so much for that on behalf of everybody. Yeah. But um, Owen, I, I was just stunned by his work when I first saw it. Uh, just beautiful like, sculptural quality to it, but he's not afraid to use... 
uh, modern methods like CNC methods where appropriate, but I know you can't always pull off these sculptural effects without getting down and dirty with hand, mm -hmm. hand work. So I'm so glad to have you here. Could you tell us about this um, sweet little piece? Yeah, I'm sure. So uh, the original piece that I was actually planning to make for um, this exhibit was a commission piece that I've been working on um, that's a music stand. It's, this, it's three spiral bent laminations that kind of terminate. And um, But I, I got so bogged down in the design for that, that sort of like beginning of August, I was like, there's absolutely no way I'm going to be able to get this done in time for the exhibit. Right. And I've been tossing around a few ideas in my head for a larger cabinet piece that has some of these ideas. So I was like, you know what I'll do is I'll take this opportunity to essentially create what, I, what I'm thinking of as like a study mm -hmm. of a few ideas. Yeah. And so I started this piece and typically I spend quite a lot of time like iterating ideas and, and working out design on paper. Um, this piece, I literally started with one idea uh, or two basic ideas, I guess, and, um, and just started making without really any like preconceived notions of where the piece was going to end up. And I started with the idea of I wanted a three-legged piece Mm -hmm. that had this kind of overall shape with these, I, I really like these sort of lobed um, pieces. I did a table a couple years ago that had some sort of lobed shapes. In yeah. Them. And, and then I really, I'm sort of charmed by this idea of having this door or a panel that has some growth coming out of it. Yeah. That's like just unexpected and a little bit jarring and you're not quite sure what to make of it. Mm -hmm. And those are the two ideas I started with. And I just started making the piece. Um, I, I kind of had a rough idea of dimensions and I just, as I was making, I was lofting things out full scale on plywood and just kind of bringing things together. So the piece just kind of, happened and I did it relatively quickly. I did it in about three weeks. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of veneer work, obviously, um, you know, talking about sort of modern techniques, uh, a lot of the ways that I do these shaped pieces is I, I start with a bent lamination, just a regular bent lamination. And then I cut that into pieces and then carve the lobe shapes on the CNC and then bring them together back on on the mold and get them to all fare in so the curves all match up oh, and then that nice. gets veneered and then glued back together, reassembled wow. into a panel. That's and clever. The, the door was essentially the same idea. I started with one bent lamination that was half an inch thick and one bent lamination that was one inch thick and I, I made the the matching cuts for this and right. then this piece came out and that got carved to the shape on the CNC and then veneered and then reassembled wow. back together. That's incredible because yeah. so, that first looks almost solid, you know? And yeah, then that's the idea is I want it to look like uh, you know, I'm, I'm, what I'm particularly interested in are these sort of organic shapes that have a, uh, uh, um, uh, architectural feel. I'm, I'm really fascinated with like the way that plants grow and the way that seeds form and they have organic con like organic looking parts but also very architectural looking mm. parts and the way that those two things combine. So mm. um, like I said this essentially is I'm thinking of it as a study for a larger piece mm. that will involve some of the same techniques and some of the same ideas. You know and, and because it was it was very off the cuff you know, there's things about it that I think work, things about it that I think don't maybe work quite as well. But I mean, I think overall there's some really interesting things and, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm planning to keep pursuing. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I can talk a little bit about the, I really like the idea of having a, a darker cabinet with a lighter mm -hmm. interior. So when you open the cabinet, you know, you're, you're not it's losing things. Surprise. And then you get, exactly, yeah. it's a nice surprise where you're not yeah. expecting it to, to be that. And I, you know, I tried to sort of keep the integrity of the book match veneer and then water falling the edges down. Mm -hmm. It's an adjustable shelf. And, and running the grain like that front to back. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what, one of the things I really like about designing with veneer is you get to do like really unexpected things. Yeah. You know, I know you do a lot of veneer work in, yes. in, in your pieces yeah. and you know you can do things that you just can't do with solid wood in a decorative way yeah exactly yeah did, did we see the side i want to just see if yeah turn it's it spinning so around so yeah it's got these I love that and there's there's actually sort of a mathematical relationship between these three i didn't want to just do three even pieces so mm -hmm. um there is 
it's not quite a um, golden ratio between the three pieces, but it's it's very close. And mm-hmm. um, that was sort of my that was my starting point. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the veneer is a fumed eucalyptus, um, so it's it actually starts out kind of this color, or closer to the sapwood color, and then it's it's fumed with the ammonia, the ammonia. same way that they would do yeah. you know, mission style furniture, uh, fuming the oak, and then it, that reacts with tannins and darkens it. It so. goes quite dark. I mean, yeah. is it this? It's not black at all at first. It's or is it no. It's dark it's very light. It's honey colored. It's close yeah. to that color. So I actually did. I don't know. If, I did a demi lune table a couple of years ago that had like a carved bowl that was painted blue. Mm-hmm. That was eucalyptus that hadn't been fumed, and that's it's like a honey amber color. It's wow. beautiful. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. I'm glad you shared that about that. And so this is all the same eucalyptus. Yeah, it's veneer? it's veneer that I got. I was out at Mark Adams School in. Um, in Indiana last summer, and they um, they get these like amazing bundles of veneers from some veneer factory that's in the area, and they, they they're just cutoffs from like longer panel lengths. They're about this big, yeah. and they do like a sale for the students where they just have they lay out this table and they just have all these bundles of these in- like kind of incredible veneers, and yeah. they're selling for like twenty five bucks a bundle. I bought a bunch of these like shorter pieces, which are perfect for small little sure. projects like this. So. Yeah, and it's incredibly curly too. It's so. really curly. Like, shockingly curly actually to the point where I couldn't even flatten it to as, as much as I typically yeah, would it has because texture. I I, um, I was concerned about sanding through the veneer obviously but what was interesting is as I was interacting with people today looking at the piece how many people commented on how much they liked that texture yeah that it almost added like an element to the piece where right. I was thinking of it as something that almost was undesirable like right. a, a lot of people you like interacting the, with a piece like commented on it being like a feature that they liked yeah. which which I always that's one of the things that I love about interacting with people that are seeing the piece is you get that feedback loop that you don't get in your shop right. you know where exactly. it's like I was just like oh man at some point I'm gonna have to put more finish on this flatten it out yeah. you know and yeah and, it creates a texture yeah it's, it's not it's not too far from as if you almost carved it I, well it, I actually had a couple of people ask me if I'd carved it. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. So yeah, exactly. Interesting. So. Oh, beautiful piece. Yeah. I love how everything worked together and the organic nature of yeah, it. Yeah, it's Those fun. technical points. I mean, you got me thinking. Man, that's quite an approach. And yeah, to do something that organic that quickly and efficiently using those methods. Yeah, well, I, one of the things that I'm really sort of interested in going forward, like I said, this, I was sort of thinking this as a study, is is doing sort of larger scale pieces using the same techniques and, yeah. and, and creating these pieces that just are, you know, I, 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 I aspire to make things that just look like sculptures. I love yeah. it. I yeah. love it. And you <laughs> certainly have. And people will probably want to see more of your work. Where can they go to? Um, uh, OwenHarris.com. Uh, O-W-A-I-N. And uh, uh, yeah, all my stuff is there. Awesome, Owen. Thank you yeah. so much for of taking course, the time. Of course. My pleasure. This. Yeah. Good to see you. You too. <laughs> All right, we just caught him before he was about to escape and head home. The great John Brooks. I hope you don't mind me saying that, but I, I think you're great. <laughs> but he's, uh, he's probably considered the more eccentric of the furniture masters because his furniture pushes in directions that most of us don't dare to go. But um, very natural in his approach, but I'm not gonna try to say any more about it. I'm just gonna let him describe this bench we have right behind us here. What can you tell us about that bench, John? Well, um, if you saw um, <clears throat> Ted Blatchley's chest over there. Yes. This is from the same Flitch. Oh. Wood. Yeah, I got it from Ted. It's awesome. And it's got a um, a dye on the surface, the yellow dye. Mm-hmm. The legs are all uh, natural trees that I've found in the forest, mm. some of which, um, when you see the hook on the end like that, mm-hmm. the ground level may have been oh, about back. there, and I've actually dug them up to get that shape. Yeah. So, you know, they're just natural tree shapes, all made out of hard, mostly hard maple. Yes, yeah. that's awesome. And they're going into a, a 
the, uh, a I cavity or a, a, a mortise that comes up to within a quarter inch of the seat. Oh, nice. So they're they're well secured there, and they, because it's uh, strength in numbers, mm -hmm. so it's very secure. Guess, the yeah. ones in the center are a little bit shorter, so when two people are sitting on it. All the pressure is on the two ends. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Assuming the floor is flat. Yeah, right. That's true. Yeah. And when is that ever the case? Yeah, really. Yeah. So it's got 11 legs. What, what did you call it? Uh, running bench. Running bench. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's something about, you know, all the legs on it look like they're trying to move. They really do. I yeah. mean, did you stand back and study to orient them well, in a certain I, way? Well, I really do look for a relationship. Like, like this one is talking to that one. They're all mm -hmm. in conversation, and the relationship <laughs> actually takes a while. So I'll set them up, and I keep, just keep turning them right. until all of a sudden it clicks, and, you know, I say, yeah. that's it, and then I'll you know, pin them in place. I yeah. knew you had to look yeah. at that because it does strike me when I look at it, it felt like it was in motion. Right. And yeah. Nothing and, felt and off. Not only are they glued with epoxy into the tenon, but they, if you notice, there's a little black pin, a Delrin pin going through it. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like a double insurance policy where, right. you know, if the glue lets go, the pin's going to hold it in. So there's a lot of strength there. Wow. Yeah. And then this little decorative treatment you put yeah, on the legs? Yeah, okay, so it starts with a brown uh, uh, <clears throat> Liquidex or Windsor Newton paint. This I've got two coats on. Mm -hmm. If you look closely, you can still see through the grain mm -hmm. a little yeah. bit. And uh, two coats of that, then three coats of lacquer. Mm -hmm. Then I'll take a Dremel tool and very quickly do the hieroglyphics. If I'm slow, I don't do it. It's got to be fast. Right. Up and down, all the way around the leg. Yeah. And then I'll rub in uh, a uh, <clears throat> aniline dye into the surface, which is not affected, affecting the uh, surface right. of the, the wood because it's it's resisting through the lacquer. It's sealed. So, yeah. And this is just raw wood, so it all runs nicely in. And I'll put another three coats of lacquer over that. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, there's yeah. that tactile feel yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. What do you call those, like hieroglyphics or something? Yeah, just hieroglyphics. It's kind of the sort of thing I used to do in study hall, you know, just, <laughs> you know, making these hieroglyphics. But they have to be quickly right. done. Yeah. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, they do have a real There's a flow. rubber foot down below to give it a little extra strength mm -hmm. uh, so that the feet don't slip on the floor. That's so great. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's an amazing piece, yeah. John. Thank you. So is this spoken for already or is it in a go into a gallery or after it leaves uh, here? I've got somebody who's really interested in it. Oh, nice. She's told me that for quite a few times. We'll oh, really? see what happens. Yeah. yeah. So, But if people want to see more photos of your work, where would they go? Uh, well, under my website, John at John, johnbrooks.org. Johnbrooks.org. Yeah. Thank you so much for oh, taking sure. the time. Yeah. Sorry to hold you out. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> All right. We'll yeah, see you later. We have the treat of another Tim Coleman piece. This piece is actually staying here in this exhibit for a few weeks. So I just love the scale of it and uh, the materials of really spectacular, but we're going to let Tim tell us more about it. So this uh, is what I call my lotus table, and I've actually made uh, a number of lotus tables with uh, the, the structure being th the same with these uh, legs with this taper uh, and swell from the bottom to the top, and it evokes uh, a lotus flower, which uh, the, the shape of the top um, is the kind of lotus flower on the lily pad yeah, type yeah. thing, and then the way the uh, root structure actually goes down uh, underneath the water. Uh, so I was evoking that um, that feeling and pattern of the, of the lotus table. The uh, surface veneer is uh, bubinga, but it's cut in a way from the from the tree 
uh, where they're actually cutting it from the circumference of the log. So it's what they call rotary sawn veneer. So what that, uh, what that means is the pieces of veneer can be extremely wide, but it also gives it a unique character to the, to the grain of the wood. It's almost um, like it's folding, you know, folded and folding in on itself. And you know, quite liquid to me. It's almost yeah. like lava. It's, it feels so sweet. And the uh, marquetry pattern around the perimeter is inspired by Arabic script, which I've always been uh, taken with and, and inspired by um, patterns and artwork from uh, from the Middle East. And these are uh, uh, just as uh, Arabic script is often done in a very stylized way. Uh, I'm taking some of the, the shapes, uh, the flowing lines, the flowing tapering lines of the, of the characters and uh, interpreting them in, in my own way. And uh, this is done in a, in a marquetry method just as uh, my uh, walnut cabinet. So it, when with marquetry you're uh, taking both pieces of material. So you're the background wood of Bubinga and the inlay of the Wenge. You place the Wenge piece underneath the the bubinga, and you saw through both at the same time, so that uh, the pieces fit uh, perfectly together. Uh, unlike trying to create a recess and then a, a piece that fills in that recess, you're cutting both at the same time for a seamless, a seamless fit. Oh, beautiful, just Thank gorgeous you. piece. Is that also considered to be blistered or quilted? Uh, I, um, technically, no. No. Um, I, I think uh, blistered and quilted would be figures that come from uh, flats or flats on. Yes. Yeah, I've never uh, seen rotary cut yield that type of figure. Yeah, yeah, it's and amazing. It, it has tremendous depth to it. It just, yeah. I mean, you feel like you could just dive right in. Yeah, <laughs> just gorgeous. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Oh, well, thank you for the time telling us about it. Yeah.